Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Costume Co. And today I have an amazing guest with me and she's been on the show before, so this is a real treat for us. I am so delighted to welcome Angelina Kekic. She is the costume designer of the latest hit show. It's a Paramount Plus show. It's called Grease Rise of the Pink Ladies. And I've had the opportunity to see the first three episodes. It's amazing. Uh, the costumes are to die for. And I'm so delighted to have Angelina here to to talk about the costumes. So welcome, Angelina. How are you today? Hi, Heidi. <laughs> I'm awesome. Thank you so much. So glad to see you again. It's been you a couple well. years. It has. Um, and so, you know, you actually, I just, before we get into this, I had you, I interviewed you for The Stand, uh, which was yeah. a great show. I absolutely loved it. And totally down my alley. Like I love that sort of dark dystopian sort of Stephen King type thing. And then I also had you on for the Costume Designer Diaries as well. So uh, we've had That's you. right. We did that been, last like, year. Yeah. So you're like a regular. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we only have a certain amount of time, so we got to get to all these questions. So uh, I'm going to start off by asking Angelina, how did you get uh, involved in the project Grease, Rise of the Pink Ladies? Well, first, first of all, as we all know, the Canadian film community is small, and uh, I had I had heard some rumbling that uh, Grease, the prequel, was coming to Vancouver, and I was like. Oh, I got to know if you know if this is real news or fake news. So I remember calling my agent Ralph and I said, you know, Ralph is is Greasy the prequel coming to Vancouver and uh, the first thing that he came out of his mouth he's like, "Yes. Do you want to go up for it?" I'm like, "Yes." I said, "Please get me on this." I said, "I want the opportunity and this is an opportunity a lifetime and I'm such a huge fan of Greece." And so the next thing I knew, I got an interview and I remember I was uh, being interviewed with the creator showrunner Annabelle Oaks and producer director Alethea Jones. And I remember just the passion they had for the project and how excited they were. And I remember just, I was be I felt excited to be with them in this interview and, you know, talk about the show and, and talk about the original piece. And then the next thing I knew, I, you know, I, I did a presentation pitch and package to the studio. And, uh, you know, after that, I, um, they came back and approved me and uh, I came in to do the pilot and episode two and three and, it was just, you know, Heidi, for, for a costume designer to be part of something, in my personal opinion, you know, it, it being a theater production, uh, you know, of course, the 1978 film production of it, to be part of this iconic piece of, uh, of musical film, which has become a, a big part of pop culture and, you know, and of course, an influence in in today's fashion and and for the last four decades so you know for me it was it was uh it was such an honor to be part of this i didn't mention this to you in our preamble like in our previous discussion but uh -huh. i had a grease club when i was uh, little oh, uh, really? <laughs> <laughs> when the movie came out uh i was 10 uh -huh. and we had yeah my girlfriends and i we had in the summer we had like an attic of a garage so we'd have our clubs up there and we had a grease club and i don't know what we did or anything but we we would like listen to the record and we would sing and we would dress up and everything so uh so yeah absolutely uh i loved the original but i also love uh, this reincarnation of it as well so or prequel I should say so okay next question so what type of research did you do to prepare for this series and did you take some inspiration from the original 1978 movie or the musical that it was based upon uh you know I uh, see Heidi for for me I basically the moment that I got the job I immersed myself in every way that you can imagine into the 50s I started, you know, looking at 1950s fashion magazines, Sears catalogs, uh, became my best friend, um, home and family magazines, 
Um, I started purchasing uh, 19, original 1950s dress patterns for men, women, and children. Um, I had an opportunity to uh, look at original footage and family out al photo albums, newspaper articles, um, uh, visual, you know, any, any type of visual reference that I could get to. And then, of course, you know, it, it was important to look at, you know, a World War II post and, you know, and look at the history of what happened after World War II. And so, you know, again, I was looking at politics, business, uh, clothing attire, um, music, the arts, anything I, I could get a hand, my hands on to really get a feel of who the people were after the war and what was happening. And of course, everything just kind of flourished afterwards. And people were excited about life again. And, and you know, and then the more, the more I read, I, I started to learn that, you know, the youth are, were the ones that all the advertisements were being targeted towards, right? They were the ones who had the money. And so, you know, and that again, you know, there was an influence of fashion and so on. So, you know, that was really important for me to really have a good understanding historically to where we were in 1954, because, you know, we look at today when we when we wear clothing, you know, we see about, you know, 10, 20, 30 different decades of clothing being mixed in, you know, with uh, contemporary clothes today. So it was important to see what we wanted to take from the late 40s into the early 50s and then combine it together. I also looked at a lot of Hollywood uh, heartthrobs. I think I spent days, just days looking at, uh, at them, you know, for example, uh, James Dean, Marlon Brando, uh, Marilyn Monroe, uh, Sandra D, you know, Grace Kelly, um, you know, just looking at these heartthrobs, who were they, you know, who was watching them, what was their attire, um, who was their fan base, you know, and then I started to look into rock and roll, you know, and of course, Elvis Presley. Um, you know, and I found some information that, you know, Elvis was known for his, you know, his white socks and his saddle shoes. And, you know, I looked at Buddy Holly, you know, and I looked at Bo Diddley, you know, just all major influences at that time in the beginning of rock and roll. Um, and another great thing is uh, I started going on to Etsy and uh, we started finding uh, yearbooks from the 50s. And so we started targeting it closer into like Southern uh, California. And we found a bunch of uh, 1954 yearbooks and we purchased them and had them sent up to Vancouver. And it was, it was amazing because we were able to go into these uh, yearbooks and get and feel who each of these kids were back then. And then look at all the different cliques of students and also all the uh, informative, you know, uh, bits and pieces of writings that were, you know, written to each other. There, I, I even found a love letter that was uh, still inside the the yearbook. So that really helped us bring the the characters back, to, you know, the characters alive from the 1950s. And then I started to watch uh, documentaries on uh, school dress codes, what was allowed, what was not allowed. Um, my inspirations were 1950s films, of course, uh, James Dean and Rebel Without a Cause, uh, you know, to uh, Gentlemen's Prefer Blondes with Marilyn Monroe, uh, A Streetcar Named Desire with Marlon Brando. Uh, you know, Sabrina with Audrey Hepburn. So, you know, again, you know, it, it was looking at Hollywood, uh, rock and roll. And then, of course, it was, you know, our guideline was the 1978 film, uh, you know, to give us what we needed for our inspiration for the prequel. And I just remember I sat, again, for days, 
And I would watch it over and over and over again. And then I would take screen grabs, write notes next to my screen grabs, just, you know, particular small details in the costumes and stuff that, you know, we wanted to make sure that we, we paid an O2 in the prequel as well. And, you know, and also it was important to, you know, study the different cliques um, in the original film, you know, and also look at the transformation of uh, Sandy and Danny from the beginning of the film to the end of the film. And of course, the pink ladies and the T-Birds. So that, you know, again, we weren't there to copy what was from the original, but we wanted to make sure that our prequel had the same vibe as the original. Yeah. Well, that, I, I think that's, um, well, you've really like a lot, a lot of research went into that. <laughs> I, uh, that sounds like, I mean, in a way though, it sounds like a blast. Like that sounds like it would be so fun. I love the thing about the yearbooks, like getting those from Etsy. I never would have even have thought that like you came up with that brainchild to look for yearbooks. Was that you? Yeah, what, you someone can, on your team? You know what? It was. It wasn't me. It was one of the people on our team who was helping with all the research. We had probably mm -hmm. at the beginning there was about eight of us just working on the research and bringing different things uh, to the group. And I remember one of the girls came into my office and she goes, "Angelina, I found it." And I said, "What did you find?" And she goes, "I found 1954 yearbooks." And you know, the light just went on and we were like, yes, let's order these right away. You know, and also we spent a lot of time going to the rental houses and, you know, um, looking at different costumes, vintage pieces and studying the costumes and the way that they were built and so forth. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Another designer I talked to, she said, sometimes they will do that as well. They won't necessarily use the pieces like you and I talked about how delicate yeah. the pieces can be, but as, as inspiration even, or, you know, to make a pattern from, yeah. um, okay. So speaking of the cliques, I was thinking, uh, wanted to ask you, what was your design process like after you did all of this research, what was your design process like? Well, once we had a solid, solid uh, foundation of the of the fifties, you know, then it was time to start breaking, you know, the scripts down and start breaking down the characters. So I worked really closely with Annabelle Oaks, the showrunner creator, and with Alethea Jones, the director and producer. And we started to, you know, look at each of the characters and start to see what their visions were and, and how they wanted to bring those visions to life. So, you know, of course, we're looking at their uh, physical characteristics, their personal traits to uh, their emotional state as a teenager. And then of course, you know, the most important thing was looking at their journey within Rydell High, where they started on day one of school. And of course, where did they end by the last day of school at Rydell Hall. Huh? And of course, you know, we also, you know, dove into their families, you know, their life outside of school. You know, a lot of the research that I did was, you know, school was as important as the weekend. What you did in school and what you did on the weekend were equally important for the youth. So, you know, it was important to, you know, start from there. And then from there, we started to create mood boards for all of our cast and the different cliques at Rydell High. And then from there, we started to do renderings and we started to look at fabric samples. We started to look at private collections of vintage pieces. And of course, as we just discussed, you know, we started to look at prototype pieces where we're like, okay, this is Jane. These pieces definitely say Jane. These are Richie. These are Olivia, you know, and then from there, we really started to study these vintage pieces and educate ourselves. How were they made and the texture and the fit and the detailing, you know, and so this allowed us when it was time, you know, to be ahead of the game in, in building these custom pieces um you know and and of course you know we're dealing with all these dance sequences and these vigorous like you know dance sequences that 
you know, take a lot and the movement and, and the ability for each of the casts, you know, where the costumes are not controlling that, you know, to them, they're, you know, the, the, com the costumes are complementing the movement and the dance sequences. So that was also really important for us. And then of course, you know, we wanted to stay true to, you know, certain costumes from the 1978 film. And, and of course that's the Frosty Palace. And, you know, and the fun part is we find out, I believe it is in episode two, where we see Nancy in the back room of the Frosty Palace and she's stitching on the pom-poms, you know, which is a lovely scene and an ode to the original films. And of course, we wanted to stay true to the high school uniforms, the cheerleaders, uh, the football players, the band, um, you know, and of course, uniforms don't change that much within a four year period of time. So, you know, that was really important to us. And also, again, we looked at the different cliques, you know, the thespians, the nerds and, and, and so on. So and it was also important that we that we complemented what was done in the first in the first film and made sure that we brought that into the prequel as well. Yeah, just as a side note, when I was in, in high school uh, in choir, we had these horrible uniforms. Like it was like a long, like a white blouse with a long gray skirt, a line skirt, and I'm pretty sure they were from the 1970s, even though it was the 80s. So there you go, totally true. Not things don't change that much. <laughs> um, oh, by the way, I love the band uniforms. That was there was a lot of braiding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and you know what we had to do for those? So the original, so we got those from LA and they had different braiding on them. And so we had to reach, we had to take all of their buttons and their braiding off, right? And then put ours on to match the original. Oh, wow. That's a lot of work. Um, well, and, and <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and then you have to, of course you have to mark, like, where did we do all the changes so then it can get changed back after. Right. Yes. Okay. Well, speaking of a lot of work. Okay. So I'm watching the first episode and I'm sitting there and of course I'm thinking about you while I'm watching it and I'm like, wow, there are a whole lot of costumes in this episode. I don't even know how you did it. Just like, it's, a, it's almost like a movie amount of costumes just in the first pilot. So with that in mind, uh, how did you tackle that? And how big was your team to, to help you with that? So I, it was big. It was big. <laughs> it was really, it was really big and ambitious. And pilots are usually very ambitious. I would say we probably had about 56 cast members and we had all the different dance sequences. I believe we, you know, for sure we had the three major dance sequences in the pilot. And then we had all of our background, the high school kids and all of the townspeople. And we probably averaged out between five to eight costume changes per cast member. And then of course, all the uh, dance sequences, those were all costume builds. And then always remember, if your cast is changing, your, your background is changing as well. So yes, we, we had hundreds and hundreds of costumes and many of the costumes had a multiple. So think about that as well, right? So that, you know, uh, it, it added up to a, a large number of costumes for us. Um, the way we tackled it, we pretty much broke the script down, you know, from Rydell High School uniforms to uh, individual school looks to uh, Pacific dance numbers. And then of course, you know, it was important that all of the costumes, when we met them in the hallways, uh, we met them in the classrooms, we met them in school events or at the Frosty Palace or the drive-in, that each of the costumes complemented one another, but also didn't feel like it was contrived. And I, I remember sitting there, we, we, we put these massive boards together 
And I, 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 I'm telling you, Heidi, it's 10 o'clock at night. And as I'm getting like costumes approved, I'm cutting them out like little dollies with my assistant designers. And we're plotting them going, okay, uh, day one, Frosty Palace, you know, uh, day two, you know, uh, the prep pep rally. And so, and then we would look at it and it, it felt like a game of Tetris, right? Like, okay, this works, this doesn't work. We've got to change this, you know, in order to, for everybody to compliment one another. So it was, it was massive in the undertaking and then the time that we, we had to put it together. Um, oh God. And the, the team, the team was huge. The team was huge. We had uh, four assistant costume designers. Uh, my first assistant costume designer, uh, Jada Hay, she uh, was in charge of all of the main cast. And her responsibility was also to oversee the other three uh, assistant costume designers. We had a costume designer who just dealt with all of the background. She had her own warehouse and did fittings 24 seven and, you know, would send, you know, photos over to us and we would send photos to her. And then we would make sure that we were complimenting each other. You know, if uh, the main cast was wearing something particular, we made sure that our background was not wearing that as well. Um, you know, uh, also, you know, we had someone who took care of just all the dance sequences for each of the episodes. That was their responsibility. Um, we also had someone who just dealt with all the specialty costumes. You'll see in the uh, pilot, you have the mascots, right? Uh, you know, again, you think about mascots and those ones, we built all of those costumes and it was important that we stay true to that as well as informing and building these homemade um, like mascots that, that felt real to the 1950s. Um, you know, and then this didn't include all of our contractors who worked with us. So I would say by the time we got, we, as we were moving into the episodes, we were over 60 people in the shop and that didn't include all of our contractors that we had in Vancouver, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Toronto, Heidi, and, uh, you know, of course, overseas, we worked with Siam as well. Um, so, you know, I always say this to everybody when they ask about costumes is it takes a small village to do what we do in the costume shop and every single crew member on this show was impor equally important in bringing this show and these act these cast and actors and their characters alive. Yeah, uh, I think you've said that to me. And the other thing you always mention is uh, yeah. wearing a good pair of running shoes uh, yes. as a sign of a <laughs> of a seasoned <laughs> costume designer because you're always on your feet and you're running around. Yeah, and I always wear shoes. my apron. I have yeah. my cowboy, oh an apron. Yeah. I have a cowboy apron that I wear. So cute. That I keep my cell phone, my tags, yeah. my pen with me and my runners as I'm running from stage to stage. And, you know, for us, we had, we were broken up into different um, uh, offices and I had main cast office and then I had specialty co uh, cast costumes office. And then I had a spot for, of course, background, which we had to drive to. And then I had another shop that had um, other, um, our daily, like day player cast fittings. So it would be crazy. I would look at the schedule and it would say, okay, Angelina is in building A, then she must go to building C, D, E, F, like, and I would start early in the morning and I would just run from, um, from office yeah, to office. You needed a golf cart. Like I see that on, on shows. Sometimes they show people in their little golf carts. They're going from one soundstage to another. <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah, or but a segue. It was a good workout for me. I'm and, sure. Uh, you probably <laughs> like lost a lot. You probably lost a lot of weight though. That's, you know, pretty crazy. So Angelina, despite the 1950s setting, the show is very contemporary in some ways with themes about toxic masculinity, rape culture, privilege, and racism. So did this inform your designs? 
Uh, for us, we were more character driven and we were influenced by the period style. And, you know, for the actual scripts, they drove these complicated contemporary themes. Okay. Yeah. Um, now I love the evolution of the pink ladies. I know that the black widow jacket was only on screen for a short time, but it looked like there was a lot of work that went into it. Do you want to talk uh, to that? <laughs> yes, ab absolutely. I think we, I remember being in the concept meetings and us all chatting about, you know, how we, we were going to get from, you know, from one jacket to the final jacket. And so it was really important that we saw Nancy as our fashionista, you know, go through the process and trial and error of, you know, designing the girl gang jacket and then finally getting to the pink ladies uh, jacket. And I remember we found this amazing uh you know it inspired uh 1950s black uh bomber satin ja jacket and annabelle oaks our showrunner uh creator had really strong ideas of of what she wanted and i remember you know she was discussing this spider applique and this this tongue that drop gag and so, you know, it, it was it was fun. You know, we made sure that we, you know, we got what, you know, Annabelle had wanted. And then we worked really closely uh, with the uh, props department and in, in putting it all together. But it was fun to, you know, see uh, Nancy with her sketches. And of course, you know, you want to have a few of these kind of humorous moments of what the jacket looked like before we got to the final jacket. Uh, okay. So speaking of the pink ladies jackets, actually, I, uh, I don't, I think I told you this, but I was taking a few questions from Twitter from the audience. So I have a question for you from Twitter from Nani land. She asked, did you make some changes to the original pink ladies jackets? That's Absolutely. A question. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, first of all, I, uh, I had the opportunity to go down to Los Angeles and, uh, see the original jacket. Uh, I got to see Marty's jacket and, uh, it, for me, that was probably one of the most emotional, intense moments for me in this project, because that's when it finally felt real for me as the, as the costume designer of the prequel. And I remember just taking hundreds of pictures of the jacket. And we have to remember the jacket is over 40 years old. And, you know, so I took pictures of every little bit from the detailing, taking notes on the fabric, uh, the collar measurements of everything so that I could bring all back all of that information back to, uh, to Vancouver. And, you know, and one of the most important things is, you know, we wanted to create a jacket that's the prequel jacket, but we also wanted to create a jacket that, you know, the Grease fans would recognize right away, you know, as part of an iconic piece of the 1978 film. So, you know, then when, when I got back to Vancouver, you know, we, we worked very closely again with Annabelle and Alethea and, you know, we began, as I, I call it, the journey of the pink ladies jacket. And, uh, you know, we started to do a lot of sketching and we started a lot of research, uh, you know, different um, jackets of that time, what was popular. And then finally, we got to our guideline of a jacket and it was the Harrington jacket. And it was James Dean in Rebel Without a Cause. And that became our inspo for the pink ladies jacket. So then from there, you know, we've got our inspo of our jacket and now it's time to figure out what the fabric is. And Heidi, that was, that was a job. That was a job. Uh, you know, when I saw Marty's, uh, the original jacket, it was very thin. Uh, you could tell that it was a pretty structured jacket back in the 40s, I mean, not in the 40s, 40 years ago, right? So there wasn't a lot of drape to the jacket. And so going forward, we wanted a jacket that had much more, had a drape to it, moved with it, with the uh, character's body, especially for all the different dance sequences. 
So I finally found this fabric um, in Los Angeles at Reg Finders. It was a ten uh, tensile fabric. And I just, we fell in love with the drape of it. And, you know, of course it's white. So, you know, we brought back uh, 300. What, yards. Sorry, Angelina, what was it? What's it made out of? Like, is Pencil. it? Oh, what is it? Pencil. And, and you're able to uh, to dye that type of fabric? Yeah, because it's a na there's na this is a natural raw material. Oh, okay, cool. Sorry, go ahead. So, so basically, from the so, anyways, just the the weave of it was was beautiful, and the drape of it, and I just remember that was probably my biggest thing with all the different fabrics was, you know, was it gonna did it have a drape to it? So. I, we purchased probably about 300 yards of this fabric in white. And then, you know, we came back and we started talking about color and how close do we want it to be to the original and how different did we want it to be? And this was great because it was white. We were able to play with the color. I worked very closely with the producers the you know dop and then you know finally we got this saturated pink that just had this beautiful 1950s quality to it which we all fell in love with which was camera friendly um and also complimented each of the cast members and also you know after that what else is the next thing that's really important and that's the lining and the lining was as important as the actual jacket fabric. So I remember I had people bringing in me I, I like samples from all over the world. We had samples coming in. And finally, I found this, this, uh, this lining that had a two-way stretch in Italy. And I call it the poppy pink. And it was just, it was amazing. And, but it had structure to it. And was what we needed in order to take the drapery fabric that we had gotten, it complemented one another together. So it gave the pink ladies jacket structure. It gave the ability for the cast to move and dance in it, um, but also gave this lovely silhouette to each of our cast members. And also it was really important when we were creating this jacket, that it didn't, that it, again, unrestricted movement to it, but also that it complemented each of the cast members. And, you know, for us, that's really important, right? It, it can't just look good on one person and not in the rest of the girl gang. So it was important that we, we met that need for each of them. And then from there, you know, we started to tailor each of the jackets to our cast members. And when we finally got, I remember when we finally finished and everybody gave the thumbs up, at, you know, again, just, you know, looking at the collar, how much of a flip did we want to the collar? Do you know what I mean? How much of the lining did we want to see when the jacket opened? You know, these were all small details that were important to us, right? And, you know, the accessories, on, you know, on the sides of the jacket to, to bring in singe in the waist. And I remember when we finally, you know, we, we tailored each of the jackets to the four, to the four pink ladies and they each came in all four of them. It was, became so emotional. Each of them had an emotional moment because at that time, just like for me, when I was in LA seeing the original jacket, that was my moment. This was their moment. And this is when they finally realized this is, this is, this is a, a real deal. And I'm a pink lady. So it, for, for me, it's a memory that I will never forget. Um, so Jane Facciano, I think I'm saying it correctly. Yeah. The big sister of Frenchie is, you know, she's sort of your typical girl next door. Actually, I was laughing because when I was watching the show, I was like, my classes are kind of like hers a little bit. I, I was just looking at you. <laughs> yes, like, oh, like, wow. They're a little bit They're you know, they're tortoise shell and there's a little bit of a bat wing, but, uh, so, but she's going through some struggles. So how did you approach her costume? Well, well, first of all, we know uh, through this through the beginning that she her father is Italian, mom is Puerto Rican, 
Um, we know she's not afraid uh, to like school. She's an overachiever. She's she's smart. And we also know that she's a very healthy young lady entering adulthood, as we see in the beginning of the drive-in scene with Buddy. So, you know, these are all big factors that play in the role of of the struggles that Jane has through season one. So again, she's probably, Jane is probably one of our most methodical conservative in her style of dress. She stays, she stays within the bounds of conservative 1950s attire. Um, you know, for example, for first day of school, we see her, and I call this my Jane political look, uh, when she comes up to, to the front of the school, you know, she's wearing this uh, red and white and blue uh, blouse, and she's wearing a navy blue full uh, circle skirt. Uh, and of course, she's got Buddy's Letterman uh, jacket on top of it. And of course, you know, uh, that was a huge thing. You're wearing your boyfriend, you know, that meant you were going study. I also learned as a side note is if you wore a pin, depending if it was on the left side or the right side, it said if you were a virgin or not. Oh, oh, wow. Yes. Um, I, cause I've heard the expression where they're pinned. So I wonder yes. if that's what that means. Cause I, I, I think, remember yeah. going study get, or pinned. I, maybe that was from happy days. I heard that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I, I remember uh, reading a, an article about that, if it would depend. But anyways, so we've got Jane wearing Buddy's jacket. And then again, when you see her, she's just this amazing pop of red and white and blue. And it's, it's, it's awesome. And then we, you know, and then the next time that we, we see her, uh, we have the big, uh, the performance of I Want More, which was a fabulous piece uh, that Marissa did. And it was really important because she's in the hallways. We wanted her to pop. So we picked this very conservative, bright red, again, staying on that political stop um, spot, because of course she's running for council red uh, vintage sweater and we built um, a full circle skirt and again the skirt was really important for the movement of the dance sequence and that that the costume moved with her instead of her moving the costume um, to give that dramatic feel in the hallways for that scene um, and then another uh, uh, an important costume for Jane is the uh, TV debate uh look which we which i call jane's uh mature scholar look and, and uh, of course we compose it with a you know a classic 1950s crisp uh white blouse and she's got her trusty uh tweed vest and her uh you know uh, annabelle was like we gotta have a crisscross bow so you know we added the crisscross bow, you know, just to give her more of that little, you know, up you know, tighter feel to it. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, overall, it was really important that we build a closet for Jane. And I think we did a really great job in building this closet for Jane that met, you know, as, as we know, teenagers have many different moons. And I think, we definitely built her a closet to meet all the different moods that uh, Jane had um, throughout the uh, season. Uh, oh, thanks. Great answer there. Um, so the next character, Olivia, uh, her character, for me at any rate, feels sort of like going back to the 80s Grease movie, sort of like a combination of Betty Rizzo and Marty uh, from the 1978 movie. So did you look to those characters when designing her costume? Absolutely, yes. Remember when I said to you, I was like taking screen grabs of everything to get ideas and stuff. You know, first of all, we see that Olivia has a subtle defiance uh, against uh, strict dress codes, as we see um, through the through the episodes. And so it was really important 
that we showed that in her costume. So the very first day we see Olivia come into the school, we do this dramatic jacket takeoff and we reveal this bombshell silhouette. Of course, Olivia is inspired by Marilyn Monroe. And so we use this bold, vibrant, textured, uh, um, fabric which we built this beautiful fitted top and we pulled it in together with this hugging hugging <laughs> hugging pencil skirt that we built for her and then we you know again it was important to add a little bit of pop so we you know we built this thin canary yellow belt to go with it and of course the black kitten heels and then our ode to Marty and Rizzo was um, Olivia Rock's The Iconic Scarf. And, it, you know, and again, you know, uh, back then there was dress codes, right? You weren't able to, you weren't, you had to have a certain amount of your arm covered. Hems had to be a certain length um, below the knee. You weren't allowed to wear uh, things that were too form fitting to the body that accentuated certain body parts that might get the boys crazy, right? So she definitely used her, her, uh, what do you call it? Um, her body in a good way to show off, <laughs> to show off her, her, the qualities, the assets, her assets. So uh, definitely that was, uh, that was the way we went with Olivia. Yeah. And I didn't have this in the question, but you must have had to, like, I mean, for the non-dancing scenes, you must have have had to wear some kind of understructure uh, under like those types of costumes just to keep everything sort of, did you have to do that? Yes. Or? Okay, yeah. yeah, we did. And then the other thing is too, you know, each of these, these characters had these major dance moves. So again, we were looking for anything that had a two-way or a four-way stretch. So, you know, of course, we're looking for fabric for Olivia because she's doing, you know, dancing on top of the bed. She's doing the home economic where she's dancing throughout the whole home, home economic classroom. So it, again, you know, again, we're trying to get this 1950s feel, but we're, you know, we're, we're searching modern fabrics that can cater to the vigorous dance moves. Sorry, <laughs> I have myself on mute there. So Nancy, of course, she, I love her because she's an aspiring fashion designer. Uh, actually, like in the first episode, I heard her say like Balenciaga. She mentions it in the pilot. I'm like, oh my God. And then she talks about that she wants to attend uh, Trappenhagen or Trafagen School of Fashion in New York, where a lot of famous uh, fashion designers attended. So did you look to the couture designers of the day? I know you mentioned, you know, like quite a bit uh, already for your inspiration for some of her more experimental outfits. And then I also have a question from Twitter or a comment from Marlene who says, I have been admiring Nancy's skirts as being some serious whimsy with the lobster and all. And I know you touched on the lobster with me the oh, other yes. day. Yes. Yes. So, um, so that's sort of a two-part question for you. Okay. If I miss something, Heidi, you got to make sure that I answer. Yeah. So couture inspiration and then the lobster. <laughs> okay. So, so basically Nancy's style is influenced by rock and roll, Hollywood glam, latest fashion trends. Nancy's known as our, you know, chameleon fashionista, um, and, you know, and, and she embraces at that time, the cinch and flair, uh, you know, rock and roll silhouette. And, you know, and she manipulates it to express her own fashion uh, style. And so, you know, we were definitely inspired by us, Elsa Schiaparelli. Uh, I can never say it. This is so bad. Balenciaga. If I said it right, Heidi. Uh, I think you got it right, Bal Balenciaga. I was telling you the other day, I, I actually did a video on how I butcher uh, French fashion names. Uh -huh. <laughs> so yeah, so Scaparelli, Elsa Scaparelli. Yeah. I was to get that one wrong. Okay, yeah. And Balenci oh, yeah, Balenciaga and, of course, Christian Dior. So, you know, if we look at, you know, um, Nancy's first costume that she wears for her first day of school. And, you know, we built this beautiful 
beautiful, vibrant, colorful, uh, green, full circle skirt. And, you know, this is our opportunity, an ode to Elsa Scaparelli. We did this massive, large lobster. And I think I, I think I remember we started with the lobster like this big. And then we went this big. And then we came up to like this big. And we were like, they just kept on saying, let's go bigger. Let's go bigger and exaggerate so we finally got the lobster to the size that we want and of course it's an ode to the lobster dress that elsa scaparelli had designed i believe it was the late 40s that costume and so then we had attached to it um a, an um a braided uh a braided um oh why can't i think of the word um is it like a leash? Yes, a braid. Yeah, yes, like it's usually it normally would be a, yes. a, a normally would be a poodle, right? But she That's subbed correct. in a lobster because she's, she's a bit of a trendsetter. In a lobster, <laughs> lobster and on a leash. So, I love it. And it's, it's on a leash, and it wraps around the skirt, and then comes up all up the bodice onto her bolero jacket. And we have a silk glove hand that we've dyed yellow. Again, an ode to, uh, to Elsa Scaparelli. And then we put a diamond ring onto the finger of it and the leash is attached to it. So thank you, Heidi. I lost my words for a second. Yeah, I guess so, it's like, was it, there was a collar, I guess, and then the leash, right? Uh, yeah, so it's yeah. a bolero and then yeah. she had a little Peter Pan collar. And so cute. Parts, and then the hand was there. And, uh, you know, in that piece, I remember there's stills that came out and it, it like it was beautiful, the peach, the white and the green. And of course, the orange lobster. And it was such a great moment for Nancy because it definitely told a story that she was our fashionista. And, you know, that that actual costume, I believe you can find it on Etsy. It's already been knocked off. Isn't that awful? Like I, I must, where's my money? Where's no, I know. I know. It's I I've heard this like for so many costume designers who uh, you know, they have that happen. It's just awful. But I'm and then also just in a question about that. So the idea is that this is Nancy has made this outfit for, for herself. Absolutely. Everything yeah. she wears, she has made for herself. And then like we that go snake with, costume? What's yes. the deal? I have to ask you. I may tell snake. you about the snake costume. Yeah. The snake costume. I love the snake costume. When when uh, Annabelle told me bad Nancy was coming to town, I was like, great. Where do you see bad Nancy? And so then I was like, okay, we got to do it. So we designed uh, with Ocean Drive Leather a black hocature two piece tight fitting hug, hugging fitting leather suit of course inspired by Christian Dior and then we embossed and built this exaggerated bejeweled and the proper word in the 50s is trampunto snake motif that wraps around her upper body and then we finish it with a vintage sequins beret. And I found in England these 1940s uh, inspired kitten heels. And I just remember when we did this fitting, I remember Trisha saying, oh, my God, I feel so badass in this. She was just like, yeah. this, is, this is incredible. And it was it was so beautiful, the costume. And again, it was, you know, uh, inspired by Christian Dior. Uh, her pep rally costume that she wears is, um, you know, is, you know, it's it's all about, um, uh, you know, everybody's school spirit for Rydale High. And she wears the uh, a pom-pom jacket with made with thousands of strands of, pom-poms made into a bolero jacket and then she wears a kind of like a beret style hat that has pom-poms coming red pom-poms coming out of it yeah so she's de she's definitely experimenting right she's she's uh trying out all these different techniques and 
and has is she's drawing from all these different sources i'm sure like you know if she was like me when i was a kid i had vogue magazines i was like looking through vogue magazines she's probably uh you know uh trying to find her groove absolutely just like the other three are right they're all are you know again you know trying to figure out who they are and of of course, you know, that also is represented in their attire, you know, their clothing that each of them wears. So uh, just a few more questions. So the next one is, uh, I, we have to talk about it. Uh, tell me about the T-Birds costumes, their jackets. They look kind of like they're out of the 1978 movie, are they? Or are they uh, a Absolutely. revisionist version of them as well? Absolutely. Yes, Heidi. Uh, this was really important. So this the jacket is known as the Perfecto jacket. It has been, as we all know, costume history around for decades. You know, James Dean, Marlo Brando, of course, Danny Zuko, the Fonz, all wearing this greaser um, subculture look. So it was important that, again, just like the pink ladies. Sorry, uh, Angelina, what, what's the name of the jacket? I, I didn't catch that. The Perfecto. The Perfecto. Okay. So that was yeah. that a brand? No, that was, the, the that was the name of the jacket. The name the of the jacket. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. And so then we want, you know, again, like the pink ladies jacket, we wanted to stay with that look again, because, you know, it's something that the Grease fans can identify right away as an iconic piece. And why would we reinvent the wheel? Correct. So, you know, again, you know, we were playing around with what we could find. And I remember, Heidi, I had probably found between, uh, I'm going to say between about 30, 50 jackets. And I would like to tell you, I found it in Toronto in a basement with my headlight on this vintage. Was leather. it in Kensington Market? No, no. Okay. No. It Are you allowed to tell private- me? No, I can't, but it was in a private okay. collection. Okay. Oh, that's I had I, my headlight headlight lamp on. Because it was dark? It was <laughs> You're dark. in a basement? Every, okay, so that's another thing. If someone says costumes are glamorous job, it's not. I like every rental house, every boutique, every private basement I went into, I wore a headlamp and I had my wet wipes. Um, but, you know, the first thing is I found this jacket. And I remember it was like the gods were singing around me. And uh, I was like, this is the jacket. This is the jacket. It was the lines were beautiful. The texture, it had a a red lining to it. And just, just the silhouette, everything about it was perfect. And I remember when I came in to show my pieces that were gonna be my prototypes for the show, I was like, okay, do I go in with more than one leather jacket? Or do I just, you know, and I said, no, I'm going in with one. I'm going to pitch this jacket. The worst thing that they all can say to me is no. And I just remembered, I'm like, I'm doing it. So I brought the jacket in and I, of course, I gave my, my spiel on the jacket and everybody fell in love with it. And, and by the way, I noticed you're wearing a, a black leather jacket. Okay, like I'm, wearing, I'm wearing my Perfecto jacket with a little <laughs> bit of pink. So my O to the T-Birds and to the pink ladies. <laughs> so just saying. Um, so then we had Jonathan come in for a fitting to try the prototype to see what it looked like. And I'll never forget the look on his face. It had fit him like a glove. There was nothing that had to be done to this original 50s jacket. And, you know, and also it was shorter waisted. So it definitely had a Spanish feel to it. And his first thing he said to me is like, Angelina, I love it. It has a matador, um, I can't say it either, a matador feel to it. And he's like, this is it. So, you know, in the end, actors happy, producers are happy. And then we worked really closely with uh, Ocean Drive Leather in Vancouver, and they built the replicas of the 1950s jacket. Yeah. So, and also with the uh, red lining, that kind of has that, you know, you were talking about a matador, sort of like the, you know, with the cape and everything like that. If absolutely. you were to take it and you turn it inside out, you'd have your your little cape 
And, and <laughs> another thing is, another thing is, so look at Sandy's leather jacket that she wears, her Perfecto jacket. It had red lining in it. So yes. I, and I told you like before I have that as, as one of my top 10 most iconic costumes of all time, yeah. uh, her, right. Yeah. Uh, what did we, what did you call her? She's the, uh, fatal, fatal, femme. Uh, fatal, uh, femme. fatal femme. Yes. That's her fatal femme. Look, Yes, <laughs> the one where she has to be sewed into the zipper. Yeah. And she's wearing her candy, uh, open toe heels. From yeah, no, no, I was going to ask you, are candies, are those, are those eighties? Like those are yes, not 50s, they are, are they? they are late seventies. Okay. Seventies. So yeah. the exact pair that Sandy has on my sister's 15 years older than me. And my sister went and bought herself after Greece a pair of candy, the open toe uh, mule heels in gold. And I think Sandy's were, if I'm correct, they were like an orangey red. Then once we, we, we got the jackets, so all, all four of our cast members, they had their jackets built for them. Um, all were taken from inspired by vintage jackets and then rebuilt, of course, because we need multiples. And of course, we have to, you know, change the lining. So I had it stretched to it so they're able to dance. Um, and then also from the original film, we realized that, that um that the jackets were all hand painted by each of the T-Bird uh, members, which was great. So then uh, we brought in a, an artist, a paint artist to come in and uh, she painted uh, each of the jackets. And I think we even filmed her when she did the first, uh, when she did Richie's jacket, you know, again, a piece of Greece history. Uh, having the jacket painted onto the back, the T-Bird logo. And of course we, you know, stayed to the same one from the 78 film. That's so cool. I actually, I thought they were embroidered, um, but it was just like such, like what kind of paint did they use? Like an acrylic or? I don't know. I, I, I never got to see an original jacket, but mm -hmm. we used to yeah. Uh, and then you, you you know, she's probably terrified. She's going to make a mistake. And then what do you do? Right. Cause it's, yeah. it's done directly on the <laughs> yes. jacket. That's kind of terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> we won't tell you how much the, each jacket costs. No, no, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, exactly. Tell. Okay. So final question. Um, this actually is, uh, uh from Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. one of my viewers, her name's Josette Halpert. She asks, who is your personal style style icon? Sorry about you that. Yeah. Uh, who is your personal style icon? That's a, that's a tough one because I think I have so many depending, again, just like Jane's mood in her closet, same with me. I think, you know, to look at Greece, um, I'm going to say for Greece, it 100% was Albert Walski, um, the original costume designer, the renowned costume designer uh, who designed the film. Um, he is absolutely brilliant. I read a bunch of articles. I wish now when I look back at it that I had gotten his phone number so I could have talked to him. Uh, um, you know, going back now, I wish I had had been able to do that. Um, but, the, you know, the articles that I read about him, I, you know, it talked about, again, you know, there's a certain look of the, the 50s and the very traditional way of dressing and how everything's put together. And again, you know, he mentions, you know, he he's going down that road with these high school kids and the dress codes and everything. And the directors and everybody's saying, I want this and I want this and we want this. And he's like... And I remember in the articles, he's like, well, wait a minute. You know what? We're just going to throw out all the rules and throw it all out the window. And we're just going to create Greece the way we want to create Greece and have that 1950s essence to it. And, you know, the words he used was, you know, a kaleidoscope of colors and, and, and silhouettes and textures. And for me, the original Greece is dreamy, it's flirty, and it's fun. And so for me, as a costume designer and such big shoes to follow into, um, I wanted to make sure that that we that we kept on that same path as Albert did. So 
again, you know, for us, there was certain, you know, we put a 21, 21st century twist to it. Again, using modern fabrics that, that are inspired by the 1950s, mixing uh, replica 1950s garments with builds or mixing uh, true like vintage pieces that we found with pieces that we were building. Um, we stayed away from the constrictive bullet uh, proof bras that the girls wore, you know, because, you know, again, we wanted to give it that newer feel to it, right? And that just kind of timed us too much into the, you know, into that decade. Um, and again, it was, you know, just tailoring the silhouettes just a little bit differently and the appliques and also, you know, mixing different patterns together and uh, and having fun with the undergarments. You know, when you watch the girls dancing in the home ec class, right, they've got these beautiful circle skirts and they're pulling the skirts up and, you know, and uh, you're seeing the different, uh, you know, petticoats that just have this beautiful pop of color and stuff. So, you know, for, for me, it was definitely Albert Walski was uh, my inspiration and, and someone who I respect very much and um, I wanted to stay true to. The other article I read about Albert was uh, Sandy's costume that she wears at the end. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he talked about the whole carnival scene, how he wanted everybody around them to be in bright, poppy, vibrant colors. And that he wanted these two to be two dark silhouettes so that they really popped in that scene. And of course, her Fatal Femme look that she wears, those pants... He found they were, they were vintage. They were high-waisted, hugging pants. The zipper was broken on them. She wasn't allowed to eat or drink in the mornings. Oh, my and Lord. He, he, and he was so scared to pull the zipper out that, that the garment would disintegrate, uh, be destroyed. So they sewed her every morning into that costume and then she'd be able to eat afterwards and then go back into the costume again. And that whole continuity of scenes was shot over a week. And I'm like, brilliant. You know, like yeah. think about that now. You've got one costume and you got to make sure that that costume is going to make it for a whole week on set. And you're dealing, you know, with environment, you know. Oh, and they must have been sweating. Forever. I think they were sweating. I I read like he actually did one of those Vanity Fair, you know, break down a scene. Uh -huh. I don't know if you saw that. So I think he was talking about how much they were sweating as well, which, of course, you know, like they probably it, it, during the you're the one that I want scene. Okay, um, yeah. <laughs> in the shake, the shake shack, which was that was my favorite scene of the movie. I love that movie part. But uh, anyway, well, Angelina, thank you so much for taking the time to spend with me. And I, it's always so much fun talking to you. I just love it. And I can't wait to hear uh, and see what you're doing in your next project. Do you have anything lined up right now? That you want uh, to plug or things that uh, I'm uh, I'm uh, working towards. So as soon as Heidi, I can talk about it. You will okay. definitely be on my list. But no, thank you. I always enjoy our chats, and you know the love and passion I have for costumes and storytelling, and being able to share that with you is amazing. Oh, thank you so much. So we'll have to have you back then um, once you're, because you kind of gave me a little bit of a hint about this one. And uh, I kind of like, was like stalking you a little bit <laughs> online. And uh, I, I'm so, I feel so pr privileged that you, you know, you're uh, my friend and that you came and talked to me about this and you give me so much information, which I love because I have some other people that I interview, sometimes they hold back everything and I'm like, I want to know more. So I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, so for anyone who's watching this, I really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, as always, and check back on my channel next time. Uh, you can check out the links in the in the bottom of the description. I'll have Angelina's links there for her Instagram and for her website. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Take care.